Oh, we're like web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the United Personality of the Best Hair. And welcome to part six of... And the special continues with today's look at Lord of War. A 2005 drama about good ol' arms dealing. Nicolas Cage plays our lead, an international arms dealer slash smuggler, out to help the most downtrodden in the world to finally live out their lifelong dreams of murdering everyone. It does not shy out of the dark side of the trade. I mean, that, that is kind of the whole point, but I mean, exactly how dark and gritty and real is it? <laughs> For one thing, no studio in America was willing to make this film. So, funded out of Germany, Lord of War tells the tale of Yuri Olov, fictional gunrunner loosely based on a handful of real ones. It follows his life, what led him to the trade, what impact it had on him, the world, and generally gives us a nice long look at the seedy world of war profiteering. Ba 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 ba, you know, I really don't like getting political on things. The internet is full of enough content creators out there who throw politics at everything, left and right, and I've just had about enough of it. So let's just take a look at Lord of War as a movie and avoid any and all political themes whatsoever. Oh. Okay, screw it, let's watch it anyway. We open up to something you should get very used to, artistic framing, and Nicolas Cage spouting oddly poetic dialogue, talking about how there's like one gun for every 12 people on the planet right now. The only question is, how do we arm the other 11? Well, to be fair, most gun owners own more than one, and I hope you're not advocating for the redistribution of weapons. This is just to get us in the right mindset for the film ahead, as the opening credits follow the life of a rifle cartridge manufactured in the Ukraine, filled with artistic angles as we see it packed up, shipped off to the Soviets, and before long, winding up in Africa to serve its purpose in war. And... Yeah! They go there. Now that we're prepared for what we're in for, we get to the meat of the story. Narration by Nicolas Cage. A good chunk of the two-hour running time is spent listening to Cage talk about his life and the stuff going on. It works, it gives us a nice look into his mind, and the cinematography can concentrate on looking damn sharp without having to worry about framing the information around delivered dialogue. I'd worshipped Ava Fontaine since I was ten years old. Of course, she didn't know I existed. I was starting to think she had a point. But for better or worse, his delivery of the narration is... Kind of subdued. I was, I was hoping for a little more, you know, crazy cage moments in there, but... You know, I guess the story is a little bit too serious for that kind of stuff. Yuri explains his upbringing, his Ukrainian family fleeing the Soviet Union for America by pretending to be Jewish, changing their names accordingly. He has a little brother, Vitaly, played by Jared Leto, a mother, Irina, played by Shake Tukmanian, and a father, Antoly, played by Jean-Pierre Nishanyan. He was more Jewish than most Jews which drove my Catholic mother crazy. How many times? I can't eat shellfish. Oh, don't you worry, they're undercover as gefilte fish today. But life wasn't one big Hanukkah special. No, life was hard in Little Odessa. For Russian mobsters have also immigrated, bringing with them rivalries and murderous tendencies. You go into the restaurant business because people are always going to have to eat. That was the day I realized my destiny lay in fulfilling another basic human need. Something tells me he's not about to get a part-time job as a gigolo. Fortunately, he had a few contacts, allowing him to start his little business selling Uzis to local gangsters. Giving his all on the sales pitch, like how fantastic the suppressor is. And you could pump a mag into me, right now, and never wake the guy in the next room. Of course, that would eliminate your opportunity for repeat business. Not to mention you'd have to fill out the next hour and 45 minutes of narration talking poetically of how it feels like to be turning to Swiss cheese. Doing business by himself is fun and all, but lest we forget he has a little brother. Better quickly establish some character traits with the handy dandy beware of dog sign. Don't remind me to be more human. Isn't being a dog part of being human? What if that's the best part of it? The dog part? Eh, I'm more of a cat guy. I just sit here watching everything and judging it harshly. 
Anyway, he intends to not just sell guns, but sell tons of guns! The most profitable kinds of guns to sell. Black market merch to fuel wars. Always in demand, and better profit margins there than selling to civilians. Besides, what do they have going for them in the restaurant business? This is shit. This is shit. It's true. But maybe doing nothing's better than doing this. But you see, Vitaly is not nearly as enthusiastic about money by any means necessary. Which would explain why his restaurant's doing so poorly if my time in Pizza Tycoon has taught me anything. Eventually, appealing to their blood relationship, Yuri gets him on board and they're off to make deals. Still not easy for up-and-comers, what with the already established governments fueling the Cold War and all that, and all those already in positions of prestige, such as Ian Holm here, playing Simeon Weiss, who is far too important to do business with the likes of the Orlov bros. You think I just sell guns, don't you? I don't I take sides. But in the Iran-Iraq war, you sold guns to both sides. Well, what's the point in having standards if you can't have double standards? So, that could have gone better. Thus, the only way Yuri is gonna sell guns is by going underground, scooping up abandoned post-war munitions to sell by the kilo, and making money, I guess, but Yuri thinks they could do better. HOWEVER, THEY ARE SUDDENLY UNDER FIRE! Oh, never mind, they're fine. It's just those guns they sold are being used to execute children just a few feet from where they are. It's not our fight. V, come on. Just in case you were mistaken and thought that gun running was a happy-go-lucky profession of sunshine and unicorns, it turns out when you commit crimes to help profit off of war, you could in fact help to make some war crimes. But Yuri doesn't let that slow down his business. He's got that silver tongue that can turn lead into gold, and before long his little ballistics business is booming. A 7.62 by 39 costs like 50 cents a round. Or like five dollars around with the current ammo shortage. As his empire expands, so does his web of secrets. Secret safe houses, secret identities, and secret deals. Problem is, a man with that many secrets tends to attract the attention of do-gooders looking to expose them. So, the authorities got tipped off that this boat was smuggling weapons. Ah, don't worry, this boat is now actually a totally different boat by the time Yuri's arch-nemesis arrives. Jack Valentine, played by Ethan Hawke. Not that we get into that dynamic just yet. A buttload of stank-ass potatoes is enough to deter his prying eyes for the time being. The real problem is that instead of paying for the arms with cash, Yuri's latest customer insists on paying in bricks of cocaine, and thus, they must negotiate. Harsh, but fair. But this is where the movie takes a dark turn. Or another dark turn, I guess. A darker turn? A turner darkly. Well, they do manage to sell the stuff at a tidy profit, but rather most of it, as unfortunately, Vitaly has run off with a brick and has become a frickin' junkie in record time, about to snort up a whole goddamn cocaine Ukraine. I, I start in Odessa, right? And then I, I work my way to the Crimean. You're gonna be dead before you fucking reach camp! Oh, sweet Jesus. I just realized that there is definitely some Texan cokehead out there who tried the same shit with the border of Texas made out of coke. Except with thicker lines. Everything's bigger in Texas. Vitaly here is definitely far too gone down the junkie path and tragically has to go to rehab. Vitaly, you're gonna have a great time. This is a top place. Two Ford models checked in last week, and that cute weather girl's been here since July. And I'll be damned if Yuri doesn't have a sales pitch for everything. But now that Yuri no longer has his brother for character interactions for the time being, we need a new relationship. Now, hey, remember that woman Yuri was in love with in the opening? Well, now that he's got some scratch, he can book her for a fake photo shoot and buy out the entire hotel. So it's just him and her, all alone in paradise. Guess the photographer got stuck in Miami. Hurricane, though there's nothing on the news. Those things can come out of nowhere. Now, if you're going to write the perfect story for them to finally meet up and get together, he's not going to let little things like weather reports get in the way of the plot. Now, finally alone with Ava Fontaine, played by Bridget Moneyhan, they can oh so naturally fall in love as he explains not only does he have money, he has shitloads of money! Far more than he even gets from his gun running business with his totally real, not at all just made up on the spot airplane business! Still couldn't afford paint though, had to resort to CGI. 
Ah, oh, well, point is, she absolutely falls for the amazingly honest man she just so happened to meet after that totally real botched photo shoot, and they get hitched right quick. The good news just keeps coming for Yuri. His brother's out of rehab. Uh, not necessarily better. And Yuri gets a son! Even better, the Cold War ends! Your son is walking. That's incredible, honey! Ah, uh, important childhood milestones? Yeah, everybody gets that a HOT DAY OF MONEY! Side note, surprising no one, Vitaly winds up right back in rehab. But now onto the important thing. While the Cold War was great for black market arms dealing, the end of the Cold War was arguably better, as Yuri has some family ties with the Soviets, and now they got all those massive piles of munitions and nothing to do with them. Doesn't look like a four to me. Looks more like a one. No, it's a four. It's whatever we say it is, because no one else will know the difference. And nothing quite beats the profit margins on merchandise that fell off the back of the truck. And all this merchandise means business dealings. And now that Yuri is a much more important man in arms dealing... You're late. So it appears. Simeon finds out that little nobody he brushed aside all those years ago has become quite the contender. Think of it like... Uh, you remember when I applied to Channel Awesome twice and they rejected me both times? As such, Simeon's offer to work together in this new wild west of weapons trading doesn't go quite as well as it could for him. I'm the same man who was not good enough for you before, and I'm just not good enough for you now. So Yuri, the unprincipled dealer of weapons to any and all buyers, will not be making this deal with Simeon, the principled dealer to only those he believes will further his own political desires, out of principle. So Yuri is making the deals himself, along with the help of his family. However, remember Jack Valentine? He's back, and he's here to catch Yuri red-handed. Only problem is, well, Yuri is nothing if not resourceful. Separating the attack helicopter from its weapons, labeling them as going to different buyers, and working around those little loopholes in the laws against selling the complete set to an unauthorized buyer. And while certain people might interpret this cargo as suspicious, Thank God we live in a world where suspicion alone does not constitute a crime, and where men like you respect the rule of law. And yes, the movie does make a big deal over the fact that Jack Valentine does follow the letter of the law exactly and will not break it, no matter how bad of a guy he is dealing with. Otherwise, you know, it'd really break my suspension of disbelief that he did not just club him over the head, shoot him, and toss him in the ocean. Simeon has also continued to try and get on that sweet, sweet Soviet surplus, but Dmitri won't betray his blood. Besides, they're super close. Yuri even just gives Dimitri his car. Like, fuck it, I got money, you can have it! <laughs> and we spent so damn long watching Dimitri happily just run over to his new car. I'm pretty sure every last one of y'all motherfuckers saw that coming. So, uh... Uncle's dead, wife's thousands of miles away taking care of the kid, brother's still in rehab, uh, let's move on to the next chapter of the tale and introduce some new characters! This brings us to Liberia, where Yuri is to do business with the bloody warlord Andre Baptiste, played by Iman Walker. Why'd you do that?! What did you say? Well, now you're gonna have to buy it. It's a used gun. Well, let's just call it a test drive. A successful one at that. That's a good one. <laughs> Very luckily for Yuri, his charisma saves the day and his ass once again, securing the deal with Andre Sr., who's only slightly less crazy than Andre Jr., played by Sammy Rotibi. Can you bring me the gun of Rambo? Part one, two, or three. I've only seen part one. Oh, you're gonna fucking love part two there, Andre. Part three is more up Yuri's alley. At this point, the movie spends a decent amount of time establishing just how depraved Yuri's dealings have become, even if he's just doing business. His welcoming gift is prostitutes of questionable health. And his new customer has no qualms telling Yuri how he has children in his army. Hell, their bullets kill just as well as those shot from an adult. No one can stop this bath of blood. It's not bath of blood, it's bloodbath. Thank you. But I prefer it my way. Yeah, well, if I was forming an army to destroy all who oppose me, I wouldn't be using children. I'd be using wood chippers. But what Yuri thinks they really need are some armored personnel carriers. Yeah, he's just trying to move merch, but Baptiste thinks he's got a great strategic mind. A real lord of war. 
It's not Lord of War. It's Warlord. Thank you, but I prefer it my way. Okay, how close did this movie get to being called Bath of Blood? Or Head of Shit? This is the part of the movie where they establish blood diamonds, the deadly currency fueling these wars, and lining Yuri's pockets with more wealth than he ever had before. Able to shower his wife in riches, and hey, Vitaly's out of rehab again! This time considerably more sober, and therefore able to question Yuri's moral code. After all, all his money is coming from a product that kills people! How many car salesmen talk about their work, huh? How many cigarette salesmen? Both their products kill more people every year than mine. At least mine has a safety switch. Very true, and if you remove suicides, justified police shootings, and gang violence from the equation, the amount of deaths per year attributed to guns in this country drops drastically. So, uh, what do you got to say to that, Vitaly? Damn, you are good. You really are. <laughs> you almost had me convinced. Um. Well, why exactly aren't you? I mean, you don't have to be, but it is kind of telling when your response to verifiable facts is just a simple, nah. Life is starting to catch up with Yuri, though, what with how he's got to dodge the occasional helicopter tailing him now, and Valentine is hard at work picking through his trash. Nah, no bother. Another day, another flight of illicit goods into Africa. But wait! Valentine's goons are on Yuri's tail, shooting his airplane! Charlie Echo India, comply immediately. This is your last warning. Where was the first fucking warning? Welcome to YouTube, man. Which brings us to possibly my favorite scene in the movie. They have to land if they want to live, but Yuri insists they avoid the airport. Instead, landing on the highway. That gives him enough time before the authorities swarm him to have a fire on fire sale! Everything must go! 100% off! Only going on for 15 minutes! Get it while it's incredibly hot! In case you were wondering why they really needed Nicolas Cage for this role, here's your answer. Of course, this positive attitude is just a means to an end. This isn't exactly the best situation for Yuri. All that merch gone with no money. Saves him from being arrested by Valentine, as there's no contraband to speak of, but he's still held long enough for us to get a lovely, lovely time lapse of his airplane being stripped for parts, losing yet another asset today. Oh well, on the bright side, Baptiste has a surprise for Yuri, our old pal Simeon. He killed your blood. Your uncle. When he tried to kill you. Oh damn, really? In all this time, I thought the car exploded just because I hadn't gotten around to fixing the AC yet. But would you look at that? Yuri spent all movies selling guns to whoever the hell has the money for a gun. But when it comes to him being tasked with killing a man, suddenly he turns to jelly. Just can't bring himself to do it. No worries, Baptiste understands. Oh, God damn it, you're mowing down hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children it was fine when it was all off screen, but now you're making me deal with this identifiable victim effect, and I just don't know if I can handle it. So, only one thing to do now drugs! Yuri snorts some cocaine mixed with gunpowder, and somehow that turns it into a hallucinogen? And, uh, well, it works for expressing the turmoil going on in his life right now, so I'll let it slide. While Yuri is off tripping balls, Valentine is interrogating Ava, telling her all about Yuri's illicit gun-running business and asking if there's anything she can tell them to help their investigation. After all, her parents were killed by guns bought from gun runners, so fuck them, right? I'd like you to leave. Fine, sure, but Ava, remember? We've only got like 30 minutes of movie left and we gotta wrap this shit up sometime. This revelation does put a little damper on their relationship, though. All this time, she thought he was selling airplanes, and he was really selling completely different things that fly through the air, only much smaller and into people's vital organs. And she just can't accept that. In an honestly shocking turn, Yuri actually does stop the gun running at this point. The power of love, I guess. The money's not as good, but he's still a fantastic salesman, exploiting developing countries for their land and resources instead. That's... Better? Maybe. The only problem is that the pay isn't nearly as good, but what's this? Andre Baptiste just so happened to be in town for a United Nations meeting and decided to drop on in on Yuri! He's having trouble resupplying, and he has 
all these diamonds to trade. So back to business. But Ava tails him and discovers his secret gun-running office. Never mind that for now. We need to set up the climax. So Yuri is getting back together with Vitaly. Sure, he thinks gun-running is morally reprehensible, but Yuri needs someone to watch his back, and, well, uh, Vitaly should be good enough. See, I see your problem here, Vitaly. You're just not nearly as good of a negotiator. Maybe you could just try and convince Yuri that he'd do a much better job destabilizing nations and bringing pain and terror into the world if just concentrating on helping to sell your family's borscht. But it's not just about the murder, it's the money. So they head out to make the deal. The deal. The most important deal in the whole movie. Two truckloads of weapons to these lovely individuals who are, uh, Surrounding this little camp, which uh, woman and child try to escape from, only to be slaughtered by a gang-wielding machetes! Naturally, Vitaly doesn't like this very much. As soon as we hand over the guns, those people are going to die! It's not our business. Vitaly, Vitaly, I, I get where you're coming from. You're not wrong, but uh, you, you just saw two people get slaughtered without guns. So uh, maybe, maybe lean into the angle of, hey, it is kind of morally reprehensible to profit off of the slaughter of helpless people. Instead of this wishy-washy, oh, if only there weren't the guns, they wouldn't be killed. Like they just were. Without guns. Yuri isn't having it. Besides, they're balls deep into this deal already. If they try to back out now, they'll just get killed and the gun's stolen anyway. But Vitaly has other plans. Stealing a grenade, he tosses it into a truck, blowing it the fuck up, resulting in him being Gun down right there. This, obviously, has quite the effect on what happens next. Only half the guns were gone, so I was still entitled to half the diamonds. That damn shrink strikes again! Strangely enough, though, they don't slaughter only half the innocent people. Hey, mow down every last one of the motherfuckers. And when Yuri returns to the States... Well, it's long after the authorities have raided his little secret stash. His parents disown him, his wife leaves him, and he's now at the mercy of Jack Valentine. Finally getting what he wants. Yuri Orlov, the so-called Lord of War, right here, ready to be put to justice! Which is where Yuri tells him he's got it wrong, because... Someone who outranks Valentine will be here shortly to let him know that he's going to have to go free. He's guilty, he's vile, he's arguably evil, but in the United States government, he still has uses, so he's an asset. You could argue that he is a necessary evil. I'm not a fool. I know that just because they needed me that day didn't mean they wouldn't make me a scapegoat the next. You can say that again. The main guy this movie was kind of based on, well, he was brought back five years later and thrown in jail. Might have something to do with the fact that this movie kind of brought a lot of that shit to the forefront and it was kind of, kind of hard to pretend like it didn't exist. And that's where our story comes to a close. Yuri is a free man making illicit deals and the gun running industry continues to fuel the war machine. The end. Whew. So, uh, that was Lord of War. That's the best damn movie I've seen in a while. I'll start by pointing out the obvious. No, Lord of War is not a one-to-one -one retelling of a true story. It's based in reality and inspired by real events, but at its heart, it's a movie telling a movie story, and for that reason, I am pleasantly surprised that the characters and relationships showcased throughout deviate enough from the standard Hollywood cookie-cutter character creator as to actually feel convincingly like real people. The way it presents its story is also not standard with the fact that a good chunk of it is narrated, freeing up the cinematography to really shine, focusing on the framing of the setting to evoke an emotional response or visual flair, rather than having to strictly follow the characters at all times to make sure the scenes flow coherently above all else. And then, of course, there are the themes. Whoo boy, this movie dropped some heavy themes on us. And fortunately, it's not overly preachy about it. I get the feeling they were leaning a bit into the guns are bad instead of gun running is bad at some points. But the way the film presents the idea is by putting forward a concept and asking the audience to think about it. Not just beating us over the head with the idea of being correct and all others being evil. 
Yuri can almost come off as an anti-hero at times as a result of this. We recognize that his business isn't a good one, and greed is a driving force in his life, but he's still presented as human. That and the fact that the movie is narrated from his perspective does wonders to give us insight as to exactly why he makes the choices he does. He's that flawed, disgusting lump of animalia that I dare say a far few more people can identify with than are willing to admit that they do. At the end of the day, Lord of War is a masterpiece of filmmaking, from the themes to the locales, the acting, and of course the open but still somewhat satisfyingly conclusive ending. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out. No surprise here, it comes in at five colossal crates of cartridges. Out of five. And hell, if I hadn't decided to do a sum of Nicolas Cage, I might have missed this one. Jesus. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, it's okay, the guy they based Yuri off of is long put in prison and he's not coming out anytime soon. He's not gun running anymore. There's someone else out there doing the exact same shit, making the exact same deals, and leading to the exact same problems. But they didn't make a movie about them! There is no discipline with the youth today. I try to set an example, but it is difficult. Eh? Personally, I blame MTV.